Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Thank you, Drew. So um, this morning, we are going to start with um, a problem that I would like an example that I would like to solve that will uh, help you is very close to the individual part of the homework which um, I think is going to be important be before you go to solve before you go to the team homework for this week and um, I will not exactly solve the homework problem for you but I will solve something very close before I um, start with that, I wanted to say that after we finish with this, we are going to uh, go back to the lecture of plane waves, which uh, we did not finish last time because we just talked in general about how we went uh, through the class to eventually come to plane waves and what that means. And then for this coming week, of course, we are not going to have a new homework. We are going to have two lectures, one on Monday and one on Tuesday morning that is supposed to um, make up for the lecture that we missed last Friday on Good Friday. And for both these lectures, I'm going to solve problems. And those problems will be problems that I, um, from the list I gave, I gave those few students as part of the makeup assignment. I will solve these problems in, during Zoom, the Zoom lecture, and the rest that we have no time to go through, I will solve for you and make them available before the final. I will also make available before the final the solutions to the rest of the exercises and the quizzes. And um, I think this is what I wanted to just tell you before we start. But in case you have any questions, um, just let me know, call me or, um, I mean, email me or um, join during the uh, Zoom hours for, um, um, for office hours that we have today from 12 to 2. Okay, so let's go back to the Smith chart. And I would like to remind you a couple of things. The Smith chart has three types of circles. Two types you see already, they're drawn for you. And there is a third one that we draw ourselves. So to, to show this to you, I will start with an impedance, which first of all, I have to normalize because the Smith chart only um, works with normalized impedances or admittances. But let us assume that somebody has given you a transmission line that looks a, a transmission line like this. And at the end of this transmission line, there is an impedance, which I give to you. For example, I will give you an example here. Let's assume that ZL is 100 ohms. And Z0, the characteristic impedance of this line is 50 ohms. And then, um, I will need then to remind you of what kind of, how can you move on the Smith chart? You cannot move in straight lines. You can only move on the circles that we will, we have discussed and I will remind you right now. So first of all, let's normalize this. And if we were to normalize it, it would give you two, which is a pure number. Okay, now, let's try to find this normalized load on the Smith chart. What do, we, I, do I observe? That this load is real, first of all, and it has a value of two. 
So if it's real, it's gonna be along the X, X axis. And the X, X axis is this one. Okay, this is X, X. And ZL normalized to it's here. And um, it's right this one. Okay, now. Let's take this line out and let's see what circles we can move on. There is the constant resistance circle, which in fact is this one, is the circle that goes through the real value of the load. This load that I gave you has only real value. So it happens to be Okay, so this is the constant resistant circle. That's one. So if I were to go to this load and um, I want to um, practically add in parallel with this load a stab, and let's assume, not that I will do this that way, but let's assume that I add here a stab like this, and like this. And let's assume that this stab is open circuited. What that means is that the, equiv the equivalent to doing that is as if I place at the end of this line. So if this is my load, ZL normalized as, is, as if I place here another load that comes from the stub. Okay, so that's number one. If I were to place this other load on the stub, and this is a reactive load because that's the only thing that the stub can give. All right, it can only give a reactive load. And for example, for this one, since this is open, and if that were to be this abyss, here, the abyss, then Z sub S would be minus J cotangent beta DS. Okay. Now, if that were to happen, and even if they are in parallel, so we have to um, use the the following equation that the total, the total here, z sub t, z sub t, would be the parallel combination between z sub l and z sub s. And that would give us a reactive load, reactive, meaning a complex load rather. It's gonna have a real part, and a reactive part. It's a complex load. That means that if I add to a real load, this abel, if I take this real load, this abel, and I add a reactive part, whether it is in parallel, like this one, or in series, the load becomes complex. When the load becomes complex and has 
a real and an imaginary part, that means that depending on the value of Zs, then um, this, of course, total load is going to change. But practically, the best way to show it this to you is um, if I were to put a serious tab for a moment. Let's put a serious tab so it makes it easier for me to show you how you move on the constant resistive circle. So let's assume we put the serious tab here. Okay, so here. In that case, of course, it would not be parallel combination like here, but it would be a serious combination. Okay, even simpler. Just to make my point, Zs normalized. Normalized here. Okay, so this one would have been a plus. And this one here would be a plus. And if this is a plus here, that R sub T is nothing else but ZL, all right? Which is just R sub L here. So this one will be R sub L normalized plus J X sub T. Okay, R sub L, how much is that too? But as we move the length of the stub, as we move this length here, which is D sub S, then this one changes, all right? And so that implies that this point, which is my load, Z sub L, can only move along this circle. And when it goes along this circle, depends on the value of xt. All right, so what that means is that if we do anything that only changes the value of the resistance, then, and I will remove that because I don't need it the way it is. So that means that I move on this circle like that. Or I could go down depending on what is the value of X sub T, all right? So this is the constant resistance circle. Now, If I have another load, so I'm giving you now another load here, which is reactive. Okay, so this load I'm giving you is Z sub L equal to, it's, it's an inductive load, J3, normalized. And I put next to it, not a stub, but a resistor. Let's assume that I put next to it this resistor. And this is a variable resistor. Okay, so you know how we write the variable resistors like this. You remember that? This is a resistor that changes. Okay. So my total load like here, the total load here will be what I gave you as a load Z sub L. It will be the resistor R sub L plus J3, where J3 is fixed. And let's, just, and, and let's assume that I vary, vary this one. So my Z sub L, the new one, it would be now at three. So positive three is here. 
And this abel would have been up here. In fact, not there, excuse me. It would have been, yeah, up there. Zero real part and imaginary J3. So that would have been the new Zisabel. And now I add to this a variable resistor. What the resistor does is to change, of course, only the real part of this at T. And so if I were to move, I would only go along this line. What is the um, characteristic of this line? That uh, all the points on the line have the same reactive part as here and have a variable resistive part. Okay, so this is the constant reactance circles, the green ones. The red one is the constant resistance circle. Okay, so we covered this too. And you can see them here. All of these circles like this, all of these ones, these circles are the cons constant resistance circles, these ones. And all of these ones on the upper part of the circle are the positive inductive circles. On the lower part of the circle are the ne negative capacitive circles, negative or capacitive. There is one more circle now that we, I just need to remind you, that we have learned about, which is the constant VSWR circle. So now I'm going to erase all of this. And forget about that too. And now we have a given load. Let me, in fact, give you a, diff a different one. I will give you a load that has a both a real and imaginary part. Okay, so let's assume it's this one. That's your transmission line here, Z naught. And let's assume that your transmission line has a variable length or you, it's an infinite long line and you can move anywhere, all right? You can move at any point on this line. And this is your load, Zisabel. Normalize for me to be able to use. Okay, how did you know that I have a number of questions? Um, how did you know that R stub, let me see because I need to move that for a moment. <clears throat> the uh, resistive, the resistive part of a stub is not, is, it does not exist. A stub has only a reactive value if that's what I meant. John, um, in, for your question. So um, the, the Z, it's only reactive. And um, it's only reactive, okay. So um, I think somebody responded to you, which is great. Um, now let's assume that we have um, Z, L now to be at the end of the line and assume that it has both a real and an imaginary part. And let me write here R sub L plus J X sub L and I will give you an example. Um, let's assume that it's 0.8 minus J minus J uh, point two. Okay, let's try to find it first of all. So point eight is down is somewhere here. The resistive part is the circle that goes through this point here. You see that point is the circle that goes through this point. Then 
we have to follow the circle and we have to go down because that's where the negative values are for the reactant. All right, the reactant is 0.2 here, minus 0.2, so we have been, and therefore I will follow this circle. And that's my point. Okay, that's my new ZL. Normal light. Now, what do I need to do? I need to move from this point A, A prime, to move this way towards the generator. And I need to move and stop at any point I wish. I wanna stop here, and then I wanna stop here, and then I can keep going on. Or maybe I don't know where I need to stop, but as I'm solving a problem, I will find what my length is. So to whatever satisfy the conditions of the problem. All right. As I move, as I travel along the line from the load to the generator, which is to the left somewhere, the only way I can do this travel is through this new circle. Let me get a, a new one, this gray and there. So, and this circle has the center. At the center of the Smith chart, all right, and then it moves like this. Now I need the shape. And this is called this BSWR circle. Perfect. Um, and make it a little thicker so you can see it. Perfect. So these are the only three circles I can utilize for this problem where I have a load at the end of a transmission line. Um, when I add a stub in series, so I can go either on the red or the green. When I travel, then I go on the gray. And when I travel and then I add the stub, then I go first on the gray, along the gray circle, and then from there I will go to a resistive circle, whatever, of course, circles I can reach. I cannot jump from the gray to the red, the way they are here. I cannot jump from the gray to the green, but there are green circles that go through the gray, and there are red circles that, grow, that go through the gray. So, in fact, let me keep that gray. And then, so you can see red circles here. All right, and you can see green circles here, green. Green here. So I have to manage any movement on the Smith chart by jumping from one to another accordingly. All right, so you need to remember this. Now, having said that, let me do um, one more thing. Any questions about this? I just, this is a reminder, rather. Okay, I don't see any questions. What I will do is to go a little low, lower And I will bring another Smith chart. No. There. And on this Smith chart, 
now. Sorry. Okay, that happens. Okay, never mind. We are going to work with what we have. If I can erase this line. Wait a second. We need to do this. Um, okay, sometimes I have to deal with this. One moment. And here, now it's going to work. Okay, sometimes it gets that. There is all software. They have their limitations. All right, so now what I have to do is the following. I have to take two impedances that I will show on the Smith chart and add them, or two admittances that add them. And so, when you have um, two impedances here in series and one of them is, is um, well, make them resistive. Why not? Well, not really. Let's do it more general. Um, Z1 and this is Z2 and Z1 is Two minus J three and Z two is a uh, point five plus J point three. And let's assume now I'm going to find the total between the two, which is Z one plus Z two. But I want to do it on the Smith chart. So first of all, I find Z one. So Z1 here is two plus J3, so two, and I go until I find three in here. Z1. And then I have Z2, which is 0 0.5 down here, 0 0.5, the real part, and then I have to go until I find 0 0.3, uh, which is here down there and that's z2 okay and now i have to sum the two when you sum the two <clears throat> you just sum the real part so from two i have to this is my real part here for one and this is the real part for the other and then i have to sum the two so two plus 0.5 who's gonna give me 2.5 and I'm going to the new point here, 2.5, that's the real part. And then I take the, the difference, so I, do, I sum minus three and 0.3, which gives me minus 2.7 and minus 2.7, is somewhere here, so I move that. So practically, 2.7 is somewhere here. So the new point that I summed up is down here. Okay, so now I can remove that. I can remove this so I don't get confused and I found the new point. Okay, now let's assume that one of them, Z1, like we had before, um, how am I gonna do that easier? No, I'm not gonna do this yet. Let me go now and say I can do the same thing with admittances. If I take these two impedances and put them in parallel, now let's assume that I have a parallel series combination. Now let's assume that I have a parallel combination. In a parallel combination, I will have this one and 
this one. I don't have any transmission lines yet. You saw that? So this is Z1 and Z2. On a Smith chart, I cannot do C parallel combination. I can easily do series combination, as you saw me doing. But I cannot do parallel combination. So what do I do? I transfer the normalized impedances into normalized admittances. How do I do that? By writing the VSWR circle, and then by finding on the VSWR circle, circle the anti-dimetric point, which gives me the normalized admittance. So let's try to do it for Z1. So the normalized circle for Z1 goes through the center. So let me see if I can do that. Let's see what I got. Ah, I did not go very far. And it's this one. Okay, now I will um, get the anti -di diametric um, point, which is this one, and it's here. And it's right there. And what is that? This is the Y1 normalized. So Y1 normalized. So I changed this one to Y1. Then let me do the same thing with Z2. Then I will write the constant VSWR circle for this. Okay, not as successful this time. Eh. Okay, this one is good. And now I'm going and I get the same thing. Let me, in fact, erase this other circle so I don't create any issues. I get the rule, ruler. I find the anti-dimetric point. Uh -uh. Okay. There. And that's Y2. Okay. And if I have now Y1 and Y2, a parallel combination between Z1 and Z2, translates into a sum of Y1 plus Y2. And whenever you work with admittances, any values that you find are for the admittance, okay? So now I can erase the, uh, resist the uh, reactances, the impedances, I would say, rather. And I have the admittances. So Y1 and Y2. Okay, now let's go back to the initial problem. And the Y1 and Y2 are nothing else but the result of two transmission lines Okay, and in fact, mm 
there. And um, well, at the end of this, there was some load, all right, ZL1. And um, for which I have found Y1 and Y2. But let's now, I will call that um, ZT1 because it was at the end of the line, all right, the termination of this line and to differentiate. So I will, or let me put a prime here and not, or maybe just ZT. T1, ZT1 was a load at the end of the first line here. And this line was connected to another transmission line. Maybe I will do it like this to go closer in schematic to the problem we have. Okay. And at the end of this, there was another load, ZT2. And let's assume that um, these loads, when you move on one line by D1 and the other by D2, this load here, ZT1, transforms here into Z1 and ZT2 here trans transforms into Z2. All right, and so, if we had this combination, and let's assume that this was A, A prime, then that would be A, A prime. So practically, this original problem that I gave you here with Z1 and Z2 is nothing else but a possible combination like this. So Z1 here in this problem and Z2, represent nothing else but really the input impedances to two sections of lines like down here one section of line of length of length d1 that is terminated at zt2 after some specific length gives z1 and another line of length d2 terminated at the load ZT, whatever, I have one here, does not matter, it gives us Z2, all right? So in fact, to be accurate also, since these ones will be recorded, let me put here two and here one. All right, now, that implies that for me to move from ZT1 along a length D1, which I do not even know how, long it is for now, I move along this circle here. You see that? And when I move along this line with the length D2 from ZT2 to go to AA prime, I'm always moving towards the generator like this. Then I move along this circle, the smaller one. Okay. Let's now assume that I want to um, find the lengths D1 and D2 so the total impedance here that I see and all of these are normalized on the Smith chart, as you can imagine, and we have discussed. I want this normalized total impedance to be one. I want, therefore, ZT to be one, which implies that YT, the total inverse of ZT, is going to be one, which implies because yt is this for, a, for this kind of circuit, which implies that y1 plus y2 
the sum of the two has to be one. And y1 and y2 can be anywhere on these two circles. Here I have put them for the given values, all right? I, we started with given values just to simplify things and be able to get on the map. But uh, for the problem that I'm giving you down here, since I do not know D1 and I do not know D2, that my input Z1 and my input Z2 normalized can be any, and of course their admittances could be anywhere on these two circles. So Y So Y2 normalized could be anywhere on this circle, anywhere here, could be anywhere here, and Y1 could be anywhere there, depending on how far I move. Any questions about this? Okay, if you don't have any questions, then I will ask you, I will ask you a question. Having said this much so far, Tell me, what is the lowest possible value for Y2? Could you tell me how much this is? The lowest possible real value of Y2. Okay, so what is it? The smallest circle, I want to find the lowest possible real value for y2 where is the, po the the lowest the smallest possible real value for y2 when i move around this circle it's that no neither one of those i am on the circle y2 i am on the circle Okay, so tell me you are on the circle Y2. The lowest possible, lowest, lowest possible. Yeah, for Y2, the lowest possible real value for Y2 is here. Oops, sorry. Go back. Okay, the lowest possible real value for Y2. It's here. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Is that 0.46? Why am I looking for the lowest possible real value for Y2 and then for the same reason for Y1? the lowest possible real value for y1 is this one. This is 0.12345666. This is here, 0.16. And this one here is 0.46. Okay, and what are the highest possible values of these two? The highest possible real value of Y2 is this one, which is 2.2, .2. and the highest possible value for Y1 is this one, which is point, uh, excuse me, uh, let me see, <laughs> four, five, six, seven, seven, point zero. Okay, now we found the lowest real values and the highest real values. And we want, what we want, we want y1 plus y two to be one. So if we add this y1, y2, 
is going to be, according to this, what I said, between the sum of 0.16 plus 0.46 and 2.2 plus 7, 0. So that implies the sum of the two is going to be the real part, rather, of that. Okay, so the real part, to be accurate, the real part. the real part it has to be between 612 to 0.62 which is the summation of the two point point six two and nine point two Okay, and how much do we want to make this one? We want to make y1 plus y2 equal one. So practically that tells us that it cannot be we cannot, um, that y2 and y1 cannot be both real, because if they're both real, only real, so they can give us either point two, either point two six two, or 9.2. Neither one is good. We want it to be one, but we are closer to, one is closer to 0.62, then one is to 9.2. So we understand then we have to be at the lower ends of the chart. So since y1 and y2 cannot be both real, that implies that they have to be, they have to have a reactive part. But since we want this to be real, that means that one of them has to have a positive imaginary part and the other has to have a negative imaginary part. Why is that? Because we want. So if y1 is real of y1 plus imaginary, and y2 is real plus imaginary, then we know that the real parts have to be one when at the place where we want them and the imaginary parts have to give zero. If the imaginary parts have to give zero as a sum, that implies that one has to be over the axis. So one will have to be, pick anyone, one have to be up, one will have to be somewhere here, and the other will have to be somewhere here. Okay? And as a matter of fact, I will have to choose, this is a trial and error using the Smith chart. I will have to choose a point where the sum of the real parts will go closer to one and the sum of the imaginary parts will go as close to zero, both of them as close as possible. Okay, so what would I think? I would get one point here. Let me assume I would say that my uh, in my real part for y2 will be higher, okay? And I, and I would like it, let's assume that I make it 0.8. So I go 0.8 here.
somewhere here. Let's assume that they come somewhere there. So for um, one, for the y2, if I get there, so my ideal part is going to be 0.8, my imaginary part is going to be plus 0.6. If I go there, I want then y1 to be closer to 0.2 for the real part and closer to minus 0.6 for the imaginary. And as a matter of fact, I happen, let me see, 0.2 is here, without even, um, I think I'm close to it. So let me go to this point and this point. If I go to these two points, so, um, or I go the other way around because I decided to go lower for y2 and upper for y1. So let me go lower for y2. And the same thing, I'm gonna be at 0.8 and minus 0.8. Let me go a little lower. So I would like to be somewhere here. Okay, closer to one, and then minus 0.6. So this one is minus 0.6 and is going close to minus 0.75. And I'm taking, I go, I go and find minus point, plus 0.6 up here for y1. And then the real part for this, is gonna be somewhere here, which is point two, point two something. So I, <laughs> I cannot read it very well, let me see. It's going to be point two two. So this one is gonna be point two two comma, the imaginary part, 0.6, all right? And this point down here is 0.75, comma, minus 0.6, or 0.22 plus j.6, 0 0.75 minus j.6. This one, in fact, gets me very close to one when I sum them up because 0.75 plus 0.22 is 0.97. And 0.6 minus 0.6 is zero. So the sum of these two points of this one and of this one, of those two admittances, give me, get me very close to the Smith chart, which means at the center, if, if this new, if I move by a distance, so I'm going from the original y1 point that I believe was somewhere now here, if I, if I remember well, to be able to go up there, I have to move across the generator and I have to go here, okay? So that is gonna give me the distance I have to travel. So this one is gonna give me D1. And for D2, I will have to go from here to down there. So I will have to go also towards the generator. And the distance is gonna be given by this. D1 and D2. So that's how I solve a problem like this. In your case, which is the problem that I gave you for the solution, it's simpler because the values that I gave you for the Z's are real, which means 
that your admittances will be real. And then you will have the same two circles to find exactly where you can be, what kind of values following the same process that I gave you before, you can be to go close to one. It is possible that you cannot go as close to one as before when I got it. It is possible that in this solution, you cannot go close to one or equal to one. And I will show you in this one. The admittance, we go from here, from impedances to admittances. The admittance normalized for ZL1 is YL1, which is point, I believe, six, six. And YL2 is two. Okay, so YL2 is here, YL1 is here. Now, if you look at the lowest values that you can get on these two circles, the lowest real value, lowest real value for YL1, yeah, is here, 0 0.66, 0 0.66. The, the lowest value, real value, for YL2 is down here and it's 0 0.5. So by summing the two, The lowest real value, lowest real value of these two is one point, one point sixteen. So that means that the lowest you can get the closest you can go to one is 116. And that's not bad at all. As a matter of fact, however, it's like your problem. If you solve it on the Smith chart, you can get a value without having to go through excessive mathematics. And that's what I meant to show you. The Smith chart can get as complicated as this or as complicated as this here. But for what I gave you is as simple as this one. And here you can find easily the lowest value that you can go close to one. And you can say that the lowest value for my gamma on the transmission line is going to be where ZL1 and ZL2 are real but they have, I mean, they, you move on the line, so the input impedance or admittance for each one of them have real values that give you 116, which means that gamma in the form of admittances will be one minus YL over one plus YL. Okay, where YL, in our case, going to be the sum of the two. And the sum of the two, if they're both real, we select them to be the real values that I, we showed here, then YL normalized going to be 1.16. So this is going to give 1 minus 1.16. And in fact, I, the, I don't need the, uh, these ones. I don't even know where I put them. One, one plus 116, which is going to give you minus 0. 0.16 and divided by two, 
16, which is the lowest value for the reflection coefficient you're going to get. You will never make the reflection coefficient zero in this particular case, but you're going to give it this lowest value. So this is for your homework solution for Monday. I want you to uh, look at this, use that, but I want you to understand it. And I want you to really um, use that to see the, val the value of the Smith chart when mathematically you would have a very hard time finding this value. Um, and this is a real design problem because a lot of times in design problems, they tell you to match something, but you may not be able to do it because a lot of times if your values, your loads are coming from other systems and you want to put two subsystems together, somebody comes and says, I have this antenna that has this input impedance. I have that antenna that this is the input impedance. I want you to put them in parallel. Well, you're not going to go back and say, change your antennas, obviously. So you will try to do the best you can. If you could go exactly zero, that will be perfect. If you can go close to zero, that will be very good. If you cannot even go close to zero, so then maybe you have to put a stub in there to help it. But in any case, this is kind of design thinking, and that's why where the Smith chart helps. So with that, I would like to end. I know I took a lot of time, but I thought it, it is important uh, for your understanding. And I will see you on Monday or during my office hours today. Thank you. Goodbye. Yes, and there will be a quiz today from 12 to 6. Thank you for asking, Drew.